Thank you, Walt. And today we have the amazing, absolutely amazing Cecilia Holland. Uh, she has, she's considered by many to be one of the best alternative history, or I should say alternative history, the uh, historical fiction writers uh, of our time. Uh, and that includes, she has quite a few fans among some of the greatest writers alive today. So I want to thank you very much for being with us and for being one of our newest writers uh, on Ring of Fire Press. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Holland. Thank, thank you so you much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Oh, hey, we love your work. Now, for those of you who, and I can't imagine who that would be, that are not familiar with Cecilia Holland's work. She has a body of work that ranges all over the globe and throughout all time periods. Um, and from the Mongols to the English, uh, anybody, anybody and everybody she's covered. Well, let me ask you to start this with, now, I know in your bio it talks about your first, the first book you ever published. Let's make a lot of writers really envious right now. How old were you when you published your first book? Uh, 22. Okay, now I hear all the little heads exploding as they're watching this and going, oh my God, how do you do that? How did that work out for you? How did you do that? Well, I was at, in college. Uh, I, uh, I took a creative writing course because I wanted an easy A. <laughs> and I, you know, and uh, I uh, wrote this book. I had gone to Europe the previous summer for my junior year and I went to uh, Germany and um, I got some great ideas there and I came back and I started working on the book. And uh, I, because I had to finish it for the course, I didn't flake out halfway through, which I often did at the time. And uh, I finished the book <laughs> and uh, my teacher at the time uh, loved it, you know, all that stuff. And then I graduated the summer, early June it was. I'm sitting at the piano downstairs playing probably the Moonlight Sonata, which is one of the few things I can still play. And uh, the phone rang and it was the children's phone. We had an adult phone and a children's phone. And I thought, should I answer that or not? Because it's always from my parent, my younger sisters at the time. Mm -hmm. I said, well, I'll go answer it. I go answer it and it's my teacher. And he said, guess what? I just saw Harry Ford, the editor at Athenaeum at a party and they're gonna publish your book. I thought, Get wow. It. <laughs> I hadn't even known he had taken it down there. Otherwise, I probably would have had a heart attack long before. But uh, I'm, then I went down and I uh, met Harry and, and uh, met the people at Athenaeum and uh, we hit it off and did four more books. Oh, fantastic. Well, and speaking about your books, because as I mentioned, your books do range across so many different uh, 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 tableaus of history. What is it about that, about being able to go across history and write about different periods of history? What does that attract you about that? I don't know what, I just like, uh, I've always, I started writing when I was very young. I started telling stories as early as I can remember, I told people stories. When I got where they were too complicated, I started writing them down. I was probably about 12 or 13 at the time. Mm -hmm. and, um, I, uh, the stories I wrote were generally, you know, takeoffs on television shows and movies and things because mm -hmm. I didn't have any real stories of my own. I'm a 12 year old kid. You know, all I do is go to school and play tennis and um, I, um, I ride my horses. Um, and then a, a, a Latin teacher, wonderful Latin teacher gave me Caesar and Christ and uh, the Durant book. And I, I started reading it and I realized this is a pile of stories. This is all the stories you'll ever need in these books. <laughs> And I just started eating them up. But I also was a big fan of Harold Lambs. I don't know if you remember him. He was a, a, a blast of a writer, wonderful writer. And he went everywhere. He went from Stone Age times all the way up to the Korean War. And, uh, you know, I, my favorite stories of his are the ones about John Paul Jones uh, serving the Empress Catherine. And uh, I, so I just had this idea that that's what you did. You just kept History was a big basket and you could put all your ideas in it and, you know, it wasn't, you didn't have to stay in one place. You could go all over. And it's, it's like, you know, I don't understand people who don't get this. Why would you want to spend your whole life with your face pressed up against the future when you could turn around and have all time? And I've always loved history. I've always read a lot of history. And so it just seemed natural to me. So, 
what attracts you to a story? Um, something in it appeals to me because it reflects something I'm feeling about a wrong time. Um, the the Mongol book that you guys, The Heart of the World, which you guys mm -hmm. are now publishing, right. um, intrigued me because it's happening in the same place as the Middle East blow up is happening now. There's Aleppo and Raqqa and Damascus and Baghdad, all those places. But also, I've always loved the Mongols because I think they're a lot like Americans, you know, not the Americans now, full of doubt and horror and, you know, mm -hmm. and sickness and death. But the Americans that I remember from when I was a kid, when we were going to just make the world better. We were going to mm -hmm. take over the world and make it right. And, you know, and we were the best guys and nobody, everybody knew we were the best guys and all this kind of stuff. And that, that um, certainty and innocence really appealed to me about that. I've, um, I've read, I wrote another book about the Mongols eons, or eons ago, back, mm -hmm. oh my God, in another century. And um, one of the things about that got me about that was when I tr wrote that book, which was uh, Until the Sun Falls, mm -hmm. the data was almost nil. I, I had, well, Harold Lamb, and uh, I could get some historians. Rene Grousset had uh, translated the secret history, but it wasn't available in English. And uh, I, there was the Vinland map had just come out, and there was stuff bound in with that that was about the Mongols. And, but there was almost nothing. I couldn't get to Mongolia. I tried, I got as far as on the top. Um, but then when I went to do Heart of the World, it's just a plethora, a plethora of stuff. And I'd been to the Middle East by then, so I knew what it looked like. And everything is online. There's wonderful reenactments of the Battle of Anjalu online <laughs> by the Arabs, which, you know, a lot of it is pretty, pretty not terribly accurate, but it's the least that you can see a lot of it. And um, all the stuff on Google, it just piles of stuff. And then with WorldCat, the World Catalog Libraries, you can find anything and you can get it within a few weeks. You can get it delivered almost into your doorstep. So uh, there was just so much more data. And I love data. I love uh, research. I like reading new stuff. I like to get, find all the contradictions and all the crazy stuff. and you know, all the, the, the uh, people's comments and people's memoirs and people's lies and <laughs> the stories they make up about everything. I just think it's really incredibly wonderful. So, What's know, been the most surprising thing? Hmm? What's been the most work? surprising thing about, especially about Mongolia that you found? Uh, I don't know that there's that much surprising. Uh, the, the thing about the Mongols is that they had this incredible army. I mean, they probably had the best army that would uh, had been on the planet uh, or would be on the planet probably until Napoleonic times. Mm -hmm. And uh, with their bows, which uh, are, were just stunning, uh, and their tactics and the fact that they were brought up practically as soldiers, they were just super. But their political system was just primitive. You know, they mm -hmm. had, and they'd, they'd be out there conquering the world and all of a sudden somebody would die and they'd all have to take off back to, uh, to Mongolia to elect a new guy and drop the ball. And they did this a couple of times. And um, it's that, you know, you could be very sophisticated in one area and, you know, just hopeless in another. And, you know, I think that's true, certainly true now and true everywhere. So it's the humanity of it is what I love. You know, the fact that you can, see how mm -hmm. in the individual people, how they bound their lives into this idea bigger than them, but then their own lives swallow them up. That um, is very intriguing, very much love it. Very cool. Well, now I mentioned that you, you work in historical fiction. Have you considered going into alternative history? Uh, I wrote a couple of articles for, mm -hmm. um, uh, Rob Cowley, when he was doing the what if books. But uh, the trouble with alternative history is that it, it, it doesn't fit the game. The game with historical fiction is to get all the data you possibly can and make it make sense. And that doesn't, isn't as easy as it sounds. But if you have alternative history, you're ignoring parts of it. And that, that, mm -hmm. that just makes it so much slipperier and, and less, uh, less 
compelling for me. Um, I, it isn't my it isn't my thing. Uh, the other day, when we had the, the great uh, con, uh, conference, the, mm -hmm. you know, meeting with these other people who all do alternative history, I was just blown away by you know how wonderful their their comments were. But I could not say anything because you know they were they were interested in the future, and, and for me, it's the, like I said, the future is just a blank wall with my face pressed against it. And I want to turn around and look back. I love that quote. I'm going to have to steal that from you sometime. I'll just tell you now I'm stealing that quote. <laughs> but now, are there time periods you haven't written in that you want to write in? Um, oh, God, yes, of course. Um, I would love to do something about uh, Africa before um, the, um, uh, what's his name gets around the Cape of Good Hope. Um, I, uh, the Africa of uh, Zanzibar and the Sultans. Mm -hmm. I'd love to do something about uh, the uh, Black Revolt of the Zanj in uh, Iraq, which was a great story, just a great mm -hmm. story. And, uh, there's not probably a lot of data, but I could make it a lot. But, <laughs> uh, I'd actually, I'd, I'd gotten in trouble saying that once, and I don't really mean make it up. I mean, you look at what's there and you infer from what you know about other things, and, you know, bring in all the other stuff you know about it. But I read a great article once in uh, Scientific American about a um, a hoard of coins they found in Africa that included co coins from Charlemagne's time. And uh, they thought it was because uh, the Arabs had gone, uh, had had this experience with the Zanj and had cut, off, cut them off and mm -hmm. looking for other sources of trade, the uh, the the Zanja, the, the people down there, had gone to Charlemagne, and that was also the time when Charle in Charlemagne's time when Europe began to see bigger pieces of ivory, you know, like the the big salters and the uh, mm -hmm. and gigantic stuff that they hadn't had before. Before you had a little chestnut, now you have all of a sudden statues, and mm -hmm. uh, it, it, there's something happened. And that's the real thing. If something happened, and what was that thing? That's that's the big, you know, draw. What what was it that happened? That, and, um, you know, if I can find some, could find some way to explain that, um, it would make me very happy. And I could write a book about it. But you know, but so far I'm not. I have never really gotten the data. But there's no data, you know. That that that. Mm -hmm. uh, Africa's the dark continent for a reason. And, um, but they had uh, great civilizations and great cities and great stories down there, and they're just dying for me to tell them. I can feel like <laughs> my, my heartstrings even now. Well, hopefully the data will come up and you can write those books, because I think all of us would love to read them. Yeah. Be fascinating. Well, now, in speaking about writing, as I understand, you also have been a teacher of writing. Oh, yeah. I and have you've had a, a very distinct population to teach. Yeah, I taught for almost 20 years at Pelican Bay, the maximum security prison up here at, uh, in Northern California. And uh, I, as I like to say, I taught a bunch of murderers not to dangle their participles. And <laughs> it was they, it was wonderful. They were wonderful. They loved being in the class because they got out of their cells and they were always on their best behavior. I was never uh, felt in any way threatened or, or, you know, in any kind of danger. And my heart went out to them for their suffering and they responded in the most wonderful way. I had great relationships with those guys and, um, and some of them wrote incredibly good stuff. Um, they there's an incredibly mixed population. You have Hispanics and uh, Black guys and uh, Samoan Americans and Native Americans and Asian Americans and even a couple of white guys in there someplace. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> they, they just were from such a broad spectrum of humanity that it was, it, I, I learned a lot more than they did. You know. What did but you I learn? Was, well, I learned not to I broadened. I could feel myself broadening out. I, I, I learned that 
people can do horrible things and still be, you know, warm and caring people. It doesn't seem mm -hmm. possible, but it is. And um, I learned to tolerate, you know, alarming thoughts because there are good thoughts in there somewhere. And um, I learned a lot of very interesting language. <laughs> yeah. a, lot of words, a lot of weird words. Uh, and a lot of great characters. They, they're very, they're very much uh, less constrained than people on the outside. They're much, they're even though here they are for the rest of their lives, most of them cooped up at a place about the size of two football fields. And yet they have uh, an elaborate culture and uh, society of their own. They have rules, they mm -hmm. go by laws. They even have their own sort of little police force. It's very, very brutal, but it's also, you know, in, a, in its own weird way, very organized and it was just a lot of fun. I wish I could do it. I wish I could still do it. Uh, well, have you considered writing about it? Um, I, I have. Uh, there's a, and I've written a couple things that I've done that I've given as short, you know, things I read at uh, like, um, you know, when you go and you sit in front of a bunch of people and you have to read something. Uh, the problem is that the best stories are their stories. And when I tell their stories, I'm invading yeah. their privacy somewhat. And I don't know that I want to do that, you know. But I take a lot of what I learned from them and, and sure. work it into books. Um, every, that, yeah, like you said, stealing things. You know, you know what they say, hacks borrow, great writers steal. And um, <laughs> I am all for, you know, anything I can find is grist. And I put it in the milk and it comes out. So I, I really, that was a, a wonderful time in my life. And mm -hmm. What's one of the characters that maybe has come out of that? Oh, uh, in uh, Jerusalem, the book about the Templars. Those guys uh -huh. were all from the prison, all of them. <laughs> um, they, you know, because it was so similar. The Templars were so uh, rigidly controlled. They couldn't, couldn't do anything. They prayed five times a day. They had to they could never take their underwear off. I mean, they, they were, uh, no, believe me, that's what they said. They must have at some point. They, um, <laughs> they couldn't go anywhere by themselves. They couldn't be around women. They couldn't play chess. They couldn't play music. You know, all they could do was go out there and get killed. And um, they were, this was wonderful for, you know, just fitted in some of my guys from the, from the classes in. And so I took all those characters and um, I put them in as Templars. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. And now you're a great writer, but who do you read or who have you read that you, you well, really follow? I just finished reading a couple of books by a woman named um, Natasha Pulley, mm -hmm. um, the watchmaker of Filigree Street and um, the Bedlam Stacks. And I thought those were really fine books. Um, I, I read, um, I, I'm a fan of, of Stan Robinson's whose uh, work is, you know, very sprawling and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and boy, does he do research. Um, yeah. And I like, uh, who else here? There are not that many historical writers now that I like, uh, mm -hmm. historical fiction writers. They all write about women and tutors and people like that. So, <laughs> um, I was, I'm, I'm a, was a big fan for a long time of um, George Martin. Mm -hmm. Until uh, he took me back to that woman once too often, and I quit. Um, the woman with the dragons. I really yes. did not. And uh, I liked, um, uh, well, I liked David Drake, you know, like the earlier David Drake. And I like, um, um, right now I'm reading a lot of stuff about the revolution, the American Revolution, because I'm doing ah. a book about the revolution. Oh, and really? Those, yeah, those people, the the, uh, the nonfiction historians from that are sensational. David Hackett Fisher and Rick Atkinson, they write like novelists and, mm -hmm. and just incredible material. And of course, they know so much. So it's really, that's been a lot of fun. Do you find and yourself like, calling up these guys and, and, and asking questions? No. Getting information directly from them? No, I wouldn't dare. Why? I don't know. I just wouldn't dare. I wouldn't want somebody cooling me up. I mean, other than you. Oh, but no, no, no. I bet they would love to hear from you. 
Yeah, well, I, I, uh, I, I'm in touch with Rob Cowley a lot because he and I worked together for years on various projects. And um, I talked to him and he, could, he, he steers me in the right direction on a lot of stuff. But, oh, good. I, I would, but so these guys are all, I, I imagine them as kind of like, it kind of reminds me of George Washington, you know, the way that you see him in pictures standing around in there, his short britches and his wig. <laughs> I admire them very much. I bet they would love to hear from you. I'm just just telling you. I know a lot of historians. I, I bet they would love to hear from you. I'm just saying. My favorite, my favorite historian of all time was William McNeil, the mm -hmm. great University of Chicago guy. And his book, Peoples and Plagues, or Plagues and Peoples, I think it is, mm -hmm. is so relevant right now. 50 years old, but it's still, and I read that when the, the current plague broke out. And was just stunned at how, um, force how much foresight there was in it. Um, but he he does, you know, he likes to take a really big piece of work and then just <laughs> quarry around into it and go out on limbs and sew himself off and and uh, you know adventuresome. That's what I like in a good historian is they're adventuresome. They don't, aren't afraid to you know take a chance and say maybe this is what happened and then try to f prove it. You know. History is not what we think it is, you know, it isn't the past. It's what we think about the past, which is why it's always changing and uh, why it changes from person to person. And um, it's just, it's a, like I said, it's a great basket. You can put all your ideas in it and they'll fit together. You'll have a way to organize them and, uh, and it's infinitely large. So maybe not infinite, but it's very large. Well, there's lots of people, so that means there's lots of possibilities. But no, I'm going to steal, you gave me another quote I'm going to have to steal. Is that history is not what we think it is, it's what we think about history. That's Well, you know, yeah. You know what that's a, a takeoff of, is 1066 and all that. History is not yes. what you think it is, it's what you can remember. You remember that's that? true. Yeah, so, so I kind of fudge that one. So you're not stealing it from me, you're stealing it from Sellers and Yaten. Okay, I'm stealing from both of you. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, now, so now you're working on a book about the American Revolution. Are there any other time periods that you're headed to? Um, no, not not off the top of my head. Um, the, this is right eating me up right now. Um, it's a, um, I'm doing the first uh, the first year, 1776, 77 when after the Battle of uh, Long Island, when uh, Washington's army staggers away across New Jersey and then crosses the Delaware and then sneaks back across the Delaware, and rips them up, rips them up at Trenton and Princeton. <laughs> uh, and um, my, cause I grew up there, you know, I grew up in New Jersey. So I know that area. Originally I was gonna go back there, but right now, of course you can't go back anywhere. Uh, but I also have, um, uh, the protagonist is a girl who disguises herself as a boy to join the army. And I have a, a grandchild who was transitioning. So I had this wonderful material. And uh, I uh, got, have gotten very heavily into that. But I'm, right now, that's where I am. I'm not thinking oh. about much else. Are we going to get to publish that one? I don't know. I, I, okay. I'm, I, I would like to. I want to publish it. It's just... Um, not, I, I, I will show it to you. How's that? Okay. If you want to publish it, it's up to you. But it's, it doesn't strike me as it's in your, your ballpark that much. Because so I think I'm kind of not in your ballpark. I'm you too, know, we're I'm expanding too, our ballpark to include you. Well, okay, fine. You build that extra field and I'll put a ball in it. Okay. Uh, that's right. a deal. That's a deal. Yeah, absolutely. No, we are absolutely expanding uh, our historical fiction because we want to include your work. We are okay, well, really, really excited about it. So, yes. Thank you very much. You've really, uh, uh, when I finished Heart of the World, uh, when I was writing Heart of the World, I knew that my agent had already told me she wasn't interested in it. And she didn't want to have, she, she, I've never been able to get her to read it even, much less submit it to anybody. And I thought, well, I'll just do what I want and do the best I can and have fun and get it all done. And I did. I had a great time writing it. I loved it. Uh, it was just a, a big wallow. And um, uh, then when I got done, I put it up on Kindle 
as a, a, a you know a self-published book. And the day after it stood up there, Walt uh, sent me a message saying, "Is this book available?" And uh, I just felt he just you know. Uh, you know, he yes. it was a stranger in a strange land and he took me in. So, oh, no, no, we, we love your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, promise me you will just, if, if nothing else, you at least give us a chance to see it. I'll certainly I, send it to you. But I'm, I, it isn't going to be very long, but it's, um, uh, it's pretty intense. So, and I should be done with a rough draft in a couple of months and I'll send you the rough draft. But then Sounds I want to go through again and pick up the characters and you know dust them off and things like that. But it, so I'll send it to you. So you're going to pull any of the uh, any of your writing students out and use them there too, or? Um, that's an idea. <laughs> I, right now I'm just struggling to get this main character uh, to to work right. You know, you know they always uh, the temptation with any of these is just to get in and do all the history and just have them march around doing the history kind of thing. And how boring that is. Uh, so I, I constantly be pulling myself around and say, no, fixate on the character, work on the character, get him to um, stand up and breathe. And that's been my whole focus. But there are several subsidiary characters because he falls in, or she, he, she, uh, Jack falls in with, um, a group of men, militiamen, who are, you know, I hope anyway, just should be wonderful characters. And I, I could get them, like, there are a lot of places I could get them, but um, we'll see. I, I do have to pick them up. Some of them pretty flat right now. Well, so where do you get your characters? I mean, we've talked about the, the writing students, but where else are you pulling characters from? Well, you better not know me if you don't want to be in a book. That's all. <laughs> everybody I know, I, um, I use pieces of. Uh, sometimes I use, um, sometimes I use several people in one character, but uh, I, I like pick up traits and, you know, habits of speech. Um, uh, and most of all, the the worldview, the way people look at the world, what they expect out of the world, what their values are from the people around me. And uh, I'm, I'm like a sponge. I just absorb all this stuff. I love uh, dealing with uh, my, my, my grandchildren. Are they here? No. <laughs> because Need a new character, sources, huh? <laughs> you know, they're endless sources of stuff. They're very, uh, uh, yeah, I, I know I see you there. Uh, <laughs> very, they're very open and innocent and uh and clear and but oh there's also i have a large family i my daughter i live with one of my daughters another of my daughters is uh only three minutes away she has two kids um my a daughter that i live with has two kids one of her kids has a kid i mean we're just a big there's four generations in this house wow and, uh, yeah cool. no it's great it's like olden times my <laughs> mother was one of, of eight children and uh, they were all very very tight they were very close they all lived in the same town they spent lots of time together and it wasn't that they loved each other because there were feuds that have still still going on but uh, they were very intensely related to each other and right. I find that a real uh, a real source of, of character a real source of meaning in people's lives and um, that's what you're looking for you know you're looking mm -hmm. for the, you're looking for the meanings um, of uh -huh. what things mean to people. Um, um, it's uh, writing. Somebody I read something recently somewhere. The writer writes a book to forget the book. The reader reads the book to remember the book. And I think that's true in a lot of ways. I don't remember who said that. Uh, the um, writer, I write to because something won't let go of me. And, uh, you know, and, and it burrows in, it's like, you know, a, a brain worm or something. And uh, I have to write it out to, to get to it, to get it, get it under control. And um, a lot of the stuff, especially now that I'm, you know, pushing a million, um, it, the stuff in my childhood is just resonant because I didn't understand it then. You know, now I'm looking back and I understand it a lot more. 
and so you know things never die I mean, just go into the closet somewhere have you ever had somebody come up and go i saw that character and i know you wrote about me and i'm not real happy about it i've had have people say that? things like that but they they're you know so so what you know if they don't, <laughs> if they, if they don't like it they could they could I, I heavily disguise people anyway. I put different names on, and um, I have, like I say, I use somebody else's description and things like that. I say, go ahead, prove it. You know, you put it, prove it. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I have one person especially say, I don't ever want to talk to you again. You did, you made this be into a character, and I didn't even get paid for it. I'm thinking, oh, yeah. You know. Well, give me a break. <laughs> the payment is having the thrill of knowing you. How's that? Uh, well, the payment the is that so I've made you immortal. You, there uh, you go. Yeah, there so. you go. Well, now, what are, your, what are your children and grandchildren think about your writing? Um, I don't know. Um, some of them read some of the stuff. Um, some of them, I think they, they take me mostly as a kind of kindly old codger that they can get to drive the places. And, um, that um, they know I write books, and every once in a while they'll run into somebody who who knows me from that angle, and and they're always very skeptical about what those people say. But um, <laughs> they, you know, they they know me as the person who writes who who uh, washes the dishes and makes apple pie, and, and that's a different thing. No, we do not. No. <laughs> no. I know you as my favorite granny in the world. Well, anyway. There you go. Yeah, that's uh, uh, that's uh, uh, Who my, is that cameo? That, <clears throat> that that's Lawrence. Um, okay, Lawrence. He, thank you. No, he just took off again. He's over. We have baby goats, and they're over feeding the goats. Baby goats, you have horses yeah. and baby goats. Oh my gosh. Oh yeah. No, we we're we're loaded with animals here. Right from where I, besides the dog, which you already saw, from yeah, where I am, I can I can see a tarantula and a couple of cats, and uh, we have chickens and we have the baby goats. Here he comes again, and uh, the baby have, goats and uh, Lawrence. Yeah, and La no Lawrence. <laughs> no, the, goats. the goats are out there, and uh, we have lots of animals. And uh, um, I've always loved being surrounded by animals. When I was a kid, I had my horses. And I got along better with my horses than I did with people. So, you know. Did we all? I'm going to be selfish and ask, so what kind of horses do you have now? We, ha I, we don't have any right now because we don't, I can't take care of them. I'm really, uh, I've got scoliosis and I, oh, know, bless you. I can't get around very well. So and I can't take care of them. And we, yeah, we don't have that much. We have the room, but we need, to put up pasture fence and we haven't done that in years so we don't know but we had a wonderful old pony for a while uh -huh. the old american shetland pony who was um, he was really old i don't know how old he was he was like 25 when i got him and he lasted another 15 years and um, he was he would wander all over the place he couldn't keep him in and he loved to come out to the backyard and walk around under the apple trees stepping on the apples and eating when they smushed because he had no teeth left. Oh, um, bless him. Well, well now, yeah, how, how, do you, how do you use animals in your, how do you use your experience with animals in your writing? Well, all, everybody in, in my books write, rides horses, or most of them ride horses. Um, and I, I, every once in a while I have a dog. I don't, I, you know, mostly um, the people that I write about are deeply involved with like the Mongols are riding on their horses and have their horses. That was one of the part, most interesting things about uh, Heart of the World is I learned a lot about how the Mongols um, um, dealt with their horses. And it wasn't what I thought it was uh, when I wrote the other book. And, um, but uh, you know, people have cats. Um, and So do you. Yeah, I know. Thank you, Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> says, thank you, Lawrence. You want to come over and say hi. Come on, Lawrence. Come, come show on. your face. Come no, on. He's hiding. He's hiding. <laughs> I don't know 
Oh, now he gets shy. He doesn't have a shoe on. He said all the kids now, now they don't have to go to school, run around in practically nothing but a pair of shorts. He's got a TMI, shirt on. TMI, Cecilia. <laughs> right, yeah. Yes. So, I'm the, teasing. Oh, they're turning into little, they're turning into little savages. But, okay, here he is. Here. Well, hey. Hello. That sounds like another book. Okay, Lawrence. Hey, Lawrence. Nice to meet you, Lawrence. <laughs> Lawrence, well, Lawrence the one who do you read the, your, your grandmother's video. work? Let's see, so. Way to go, Lawrence. I don't know how to read that. You have a future yet. with us, I'm sure. <laughs> you don't. I bet your grandmother would help you. Uh, yeah, well, he's. he's well, she uh, writes some um, really stuff he's got dyslexia uh, or some kind of dyslexia so um uh, we, we should read it to him but i'll suggest it to us uh, well you should talk with walt because he had a family member who had dyslexia and they worked with that very very successfully oh good yeah because i think yeah you know, I, I think if we could figure out a way into uh, he would be he's wonderful at if you read stories to him He's wonderful at understanding subtext and character development and, uh, you know, settings and things like that. He can really, really piece things together. He's very cool. clever. Well, his, uh, his stepfather reads him all sorts of really, really good books. Oh, um, good. So, uh, all the time. Harry Potter. Harry Potter, yeah. <laughs> Reardon, the guy, the, the, uh, guy who does things about the Greek gods and um yeah that's some um, good books yeah we just read I just read actually not to him but to his his uh, cousin Peter and the star catchers and oh, yeah. uh, uh you know there's there's great stories for kids and um, and they give them such a wonderful you know take on the world because in these mm -hmm. books the kids have a lot of power and that in, in their own lives, they may feel they don't have any, and but here in the, they stepped into the book, and suddenly you're the most powerful person in the book. And, you know, it's a very invigorating and enlightening experience, I think. Well, have Another you thought thing. about writing some YA work? Some, some what? So, young adult work, like, like the Reardon books, or have you thought about going in that direction? Well, I think Jack may be the Revolutionary War, maybe a YA book. I don't know. Um, She's or he's fifteen. Oh, um, yeah, you got uh, one and, there. Yeah, and uh, uh, I think his experiences are are peculiar to that age group. So mm -hmm. he, this may be a YA book. I'm not sure. Um, I'm I'm just I don't think about categories particularly. I just try to get the the damn thing to lie flat and. Yeah. Uh, it's right now it's it's uh, I have to do one last battle and then I'm done, I think, pretty much. Um, and, so. and what do you look for when you're looking at books, when you're looking to read books? What draws I book, you? I want a book that grabs me and I, I want a book that I really identify deeply with the characters and feel that the characters express values that I'm interested in. And, um, I like a lot of uh, texture in a character. I mm -hmm. like a character not to be totally, you know, a completely good person, but to have to be badly in his own demons. And um, and I like a good setting. That was what I liked about the Natasha Cooley books, was mm -hmm. that they, the settings were just riveting and the characters were uh, really hard to, hard to uh, uh, understand in a lot of ways. They were uh, mysterious, deeply mysterious. Um, that those two books are really pretty cool and um i like um uh, i like mysteries a lot because the, the plots of the mysteries are are um, are so compelling um uh, uh, edmund crispin you know who edmund crispin is mm -hmm. yeah i loved his books i reread them a couple of times and um but mostly i want something that doesn't do what i expect you know, I want to be, I want to be surprised. I want to be pulled somewhere else. I want to be made to think differently. And um, 
you know, I, uh, you can't find it by looking at the cover. You just got to start reading the book. Hmm. Absolutely. And what would you recommend to young writers coming up? Because um, I guess we can, oh, here comes Walt with a question. Well, what would you recommend to one writer, to a young writer? Sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, read old stuff. Read the old stuff. Read, read uh, myths and uh, the legends of old, of, of other cultures, uh, because those things are, and fairy tales, and uh, those things are the stories that have been you know, people have told them over and over and over again and have scrubbed away all the superfluous and, and, and stuff and left nothing but the bare bones and the, and the really solid storytelling mm -hmm. stuff that's grim. It's unbelievable at times. I used to read a lot of the grim stuff when, up at the prison. And um, but also, you know, read everything you get your hands on. You know? well, don't let anybody tell you, you shouldn't read that, that's not good. Um, you know, read what you like, follow your nose, you know, or your, you know, your heart or whatever part of you it is that reads. And it certainly isn't your nose. And um, um, just, and if you want to write, write, write a lot, write every day. And, um, and what you want, not what people tell you you should be doing, but what you want. So don't let people shape you. What's the value of not letting people shape you like that? Well, you got to stay. You got to stay in your center. But one of the problems with being a writer, as um, you probably realize, is uh, that you're always sort of halfway divided. One part of you is doing the work, and another part of you is sitting off on a fence somewhere, looking at it, saying, "This is not good enough. You got to do something better than that. Try this. Try that." And that weakens you. I mean, it's valuable in a lot of ways because you, you know, you need to have that constant criticism, but it, it undermines your sense of yourself. You need to keep that sense of self really strong. There's only one you, and that's what you're doing. That's why I kept telling the guys at the prison, there's only one you. If you're honest, it, you will be unique, and you will tell them, you know, it, you won't be doing the same thing everybody else is doing. So just keep being, telling me the real truth, and boy, did they ever. <laughs> Were there any stories that still, of their stories that kind of hang with you, that you still go back and think about? Well, yeah, um, I have a, had a student who was, uh, according to him, he dropped out of school in the third grade. And he was writing an enormous fantasy about um, a, an apocalyptic, they do a lot of apocalyptic stuff, um, a world after, after Mars in which, um, um, he was Hispanic, and a lot of it, there's a lot of Mexican, Aztec. Um, oh, cool. In it. And it was, uh, you know, Jehovah's been driven out of heaven and is living in a ruined fortress in the Rockies. And the devil, uh, uh, Lucifer is living in the Grand Canyon somewhere, and there's a strange, uh, mysterious league of, of immortal people uh, who are, you know, running the ship, and there's these weird... Uh, uh, human beings, because death has disappeared. There's no death anymore. And these people don't die. When they they can die, but they come back. They have to go through a process where they have to fight their way back through the gates of purgatory to come back into the world. And uh, this was a, a, a stunning piece. Um, it, when I left, uh, he was uh, he had written over 300 pages of it. And oh um, he, he was, um, he, it was, uh, it was really interesting because, for one thing, um, he'd obviously read a lot of stuff. He there was a lot of, uh, you could see a lot of, of influences in him. You know, he'd read all of um, of uh, Tolkien and all of uh, George Martin and a, a lot of Mal Mayan stuff, Popova, and uh, he knew all his Aztec legends down pat and all this wow. stuff. But he had not developed a good sense of story. Mm -hmm. And he would get along and he would have, he'd have wonderful pieces of narrative that would just pitter away at the end and not come to anything. Yes. Um, and, and I was kept, I kept trying to get it, come on, make it end, make it end, Johnny boy. <laughs> and, um, he, 
He would just flitter off into some other wild place. I mean, this was an enormous landscape. There were hundreds of characters in this, and um, they're trying to bring death back because that way is the way to save the world. And, um, and uh, but he just um, wasn't getting anywhere near the end. And, you know, it was very frustrating, but it was also fascinating because of the depth and the, uh, the detail and his narrative gifts, which were sensational. He would, the, I remember one that people are trying to flee down a, a canyon somewhere, um, being pursued by horrible monsters and um, in the dark and, and how riveting it was, how absolutely wow. riveting it was. But it didn't amount to anything. It, they, at the end, they get out there and then they go off into something, something else. Um, and um, he, but he was impossible to deal with. He would, I would tell him, look, you can't do this. And he would say, I can too. And um, he had a, his his lack of uh, formal education showed in in a lot of ways in his grammar. Um, he had a weird habit, probably still does. I shouldn't say had. He has a weird habit of using uh, um, nouns as verbs a lot. Like people were burdened with stuff, and and um, um, it, it just was. Um, you know, I, I kept, he finally wound, well, I finally wound up sort of saying, well, you know, you're going to be who you are and I'm not going to try to change anymore. And, um, but I, I you know, I, sh I showed the manuscript to a friend of mine uh, who's a, a, an editor and said, look, what do you think we can do? And he said, he doesn't story, you know, and he mm -hmm. didn't have the intense experience that I had had with it. There was another writer up there who wrote short, uh, epiphanic kind of things, just like stories that are maybe 750 words. Mm -hmm. He was good. God, he was good. Um, and uh, about his about his own life. And mm -hmm. um, there were the thing about this was it was so empathetic. You know, you don't think of of um, people at Pelican Bay as having any empathy because you think they're criminals and they care. that's why they're criminals, they don't have empathy. These were so, these are so intensely moving because he was so it gripped by these characters. Um, I had another student who wrote, wow. maybe the best story I've ever, ever read by any student anywhere um, about a man who in a, in a, in a blind drunk one night killed somebody in a car crash mm -hmm. and how he recovers from that and pays for it. And it was called uh, Live With What You Did. And it just was unbelievable. I mean, this guy is just, again, so incredibly empathetic and so, um, wow, un, you know, unflagging. He just kept, he faced everything. He faced up to this stuff. He writes a lot of stuff. I argued with him too. He, had, he was a big one for using words in the wrong way. I mean, um, mm -hmm. yeah, uh, he, he, but they, they argue with you and you argue back and, and there's something you know, so, so cute about that. You always feel, you know, I, maybe I'm the wrong one here. Maybe they're right, you know. Um, <laughs> and, um, but there's, uh, uh, they, were, they had great stories. They all, even the ones who, um, could barely put a, could barely get through a sentence. Wow. Right stories. It was the act of getting it from the mind into the onto the page was much harder for them because they didn't, you know, you, the being able to do that is a um, something you pick up by reading a lot. And mm -hmm. some of them read a lot, some of them don't. Um, I miss them a lot. They're very. Well, did did any of them get published? Well, a lot of them get published in, uh, there's a prison publishing thing. Right. Penn has uh, stuff. There's other places that publish them. Um, I was trying to get um, Johnny Ruiz's thing published, but I never could get it to happen. Um, and this other guy, um, Sergio Yanez, I really thought he could get published if he tried, but he wasn't all that excited about the possibility. I mean, he liked to write, he loves to write, um, uh, but he was mostly writing for the class. They would mm -hmm. write stuff for the of the class. And, then, and uh, when they did this, 
the cl you, the classes. This is you got to see this. Um, not all of them, but a couple of the classes were held in uh, very restricted custody mm -hmm. so, uh, situations, and they they would bring the men in, their hands handcuffed behind their backs, and put them into a cage like a wire telephone booth. Uh -huh. slam the doors, lock the doors. The guy would stick his hands out through a slot in the front and then undo the handcuffs. So you've got eight guys in these telephone booths facing you. And um, it, I mean, it was just, then one of them will read and a hush comes over the room. And you realize they're in it. They're there. He's got them. And um, they, you can tell that for them, they've escaped. You know, they're not in the telephone booth anymore. They're gotcha. hiking in the jungle. You know, they're they're flying through the, the sky as a, like a bird. They are out and they know the real the power of this. And it's just very exciting. That's wonderful. <laughs> That's totally It was. I loved it. Yeah. Oh wow. Is there as you look back on your experiences there, is there anything that we can do as writers and readers, et cetera, to help other men like in that situation? Well, there's, there's a lot of programs now. Uh, there, there's, because of, because of the, the men themselves actually um, have insisted that they get programs and that they be allowed to do this kind of thing. There's a tremendous number of programs. Um, any, any writer who gets a chance to uh, work in a prison should do it. You know, it, it isn't always that easy. Uh, but it's always very good. And they, you know, the, you go in there and um, you're set in a free to some extent. And then, and they, of course, will, get, will return it. I'm telling you, they return so much. It's an incredible kind of situation sometimes. Um, so anybody, um, if you can uh, connect with a writer, read his stuff, help him, encourage him, um, get him to maybe find a publisher for him. But it isn't so much that they need to be published. They just need to express themselves. And that's what they do. And um, they, um, and also we got to remember them, that mm -hmm. they're not, you know, just because they're slammed and going to spend the rest of their lives in prison doesn't mean they're gone or dead or bad. I mean, they're there. Remember them and think about them. Um, um, just doing that, you know, it is enormously powerful because they feel so abandoned sometimes, um, so forgotten and so discounted. And yet they're just, you know, they're just like the rest of us. They're human beings like the rest of us. Well, those are really good words. And I, I'm going to have to end it on that, but I really appreciate your good words, your wonderful writing and your time. Thank you very, very much. And for anybody who's looking for some of Ms. Holland's work, uh, we've got some coming out at Ring of Fire Press, but there's a lot more on Amazon. Lots and lots. Any time period you want, just about, you can go there now. So thank you very much. And thank you so much, Cecilia, for your time. And thank your you very much, Julie. And thanks, thanks, Walt, too. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure he, he's back there running all the controls.